please subscribe and don't forget to press the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload a new video. Well, welcome back straight to the big story from the corporate corner. CNBC TV 18 Newsbreak has been confirmed. Tata Motors will be selling its defense and aerospace portfolio to Tata Advanced Systems. This is in line with Tata Sun's chairman N. Chandrasekharan's uh, consolidation mantra. Ron Jai Banerjee joins us now. Ron, take it away. Well, thanks for that. Let me try and simplify this to the best of my abilities for the benefit of our viewers. Remember, there are three principal stakeholders or actors as far as this transaction is concerned. Tata Motors, which is the parent company, and it involves two of their wholly owned subsidiaries. One is Tata Advanced Systems Limited and the other is TAL Manufacturing. What the Tata Motors board today, this unscheduled board meeting that they had, what they've decided is that Tata Motors will be selling off its entire defense business because remember, defense was still part of Tata Motors to their wholly owned subsidiary, which is Tata Advanced Systems Limited. For which Tata Motors will be getting 100 crore rupees from their subsidiary to the parent company. Apart from that, the board has also decided that uh, Tata Motors will also be receiving what they are calling a deferred consideration of 3% of, of the revenue on specialized defense projects for a period of 15 years starting FY20. So that is what Tata Motors gets, but that's just part one of the deal. There are two more parts left. This involves TAL Manufacturing Limited. Tata Motors has now decided that their shareholding in TAL Manufacturing Limited will now be sold to Tata Advanced uh, uh, Systems Limited, for which Tata Motors will be getting a, a valuation of 625 crore rupees. The third part of the deal, here Tata Motors will be acquiring the non-aerospace uh, side of the business from uh, uh, TAL, and that Tata Motors will be buying back for a surprisingly small sum of amount for 10 lakh rupees. This, of course, gels in what, with what the company has said to simplify the structure. Uh, according to a statement that was issued by Gunther Bushek, the CEO of the company, he said that defense is, of course, you know, is a big buy, and this, this segment uh, will be growing. And he said, thanks to this transaction, this will enable Tata Group uh, to unlock value and sort of unlock its true potential of the defense business. Back to you. Well, thanks a lot, Ron, for decoding that transaction for us. Let's move ahead now. The government has still not made up its mind on taking the ordinance route to tweak the insolvency and bankruptcy code. That's the word coming in from the Minister of State for Corporate Affairs, uh, Mr. P.P. Chaudhary. CNBC TV 18's Timzi Jayapuriya spoke uh, to Mr. P.P. Chaudhary, who also said that his ministry is still considering the recommendations made by the law committee. The minister also went on to say that the government is moving with speed and we'll soon decide on the amendments to the insolvency and bankruptcy laws. Take a look. What are the recommendations that have been included in the ordinance and which have been skipped? I understand there are some uh, good points when it comes to home buyers, MSME sector, etc. So what all are, are the points that have been included from the law committee's proposal to the ordinance? How you can say and what is the basis for it that we are bringing ordinance? Basically, the recommendation of the committee is under the examination of the government. Mm. And once the government examines it and considers the recommendation of the committee, thereafter the necessary decision shall be taken by the government. So but you mean to say that uh, government is yet to examine the uh, suggestions made by the committee? Yes, yes, government is yet to examine the suggestion made by the committee. It is under the process. And so there is no ordinance which is coming soon? This, as on today, if, when I am saying, the government is examining the recommendation of the committee. Let me try one more time in my last question. Can we see an ordinance taking forward all these recommendations as soon as next, in the next 15 days? It is not, a, it, I can't say about the timeline. Because I am nobody to say about the timeline. It is mm. a, a government work in a particular way. But it, even it can be before 15 days. It mm. can be more than 15 days. Mm. But government is acting very fast. So that's why I am said that the Modi government, governance, speed and scale is unprecedented. So we are working uh, quickly. And I think the very soon decision will be taken by the government, either to bring an ordinance or by way of bill, to redress the working of the... Uh, in insolvent bankruptcy court. 
Well, probing questions those by Tim Z, but Mr. P.P. Chaudhary not committing to a deadline there, but insisting that the government is indeed working with speed. Let's move ahead on to a story now that made national headlines. The government has not handed over the red fort to the Dalmia Group. That's the word coming in from the Minister of State for Tourism, K.J. Alphonse, defending the government's decision taken under the Adopt a Heritage Scheme. The minister asserted that Dalmia Group's only responsibility under the scheme would be to provide basic amenities at the Mughal era fort. The minister also highlighted the poor conditions of the monuments and their surroundings in India to drive home the government's point in this debate. Take a look. See, number one, we have not given the red fort to uh, Dalmias. If you look at the MOU, what does the Dalmia get? It's very clearly laid out. Dalmia does not enter the monument at all. So the question of giving the red fort to Dalmias doesn't arise. So what we have done is, as per the MOU, there are certain things which will, which will be permitted to be done by the Monument Mitra, in this case uh, Dalmias. See, they will provide, they will clean the area, they ensure that the area is completely uh, spotless. Number two, they will provide drinking water, they will provide toilets, they will provide Wi-Fi, they will provide um, uh, seating arrangements, maybe a light and sound show. So these are some of the things, and these are very, very clearly spelt out in the MOU, which is in the public domain. Our monuments, surrounding the monuments are in a complete mess. I was in Agra Day for us today. I've been to a whole lot of monuments. It's a complete mess. India gets only 10 million tourists a year. This was a account last year, which was a dramatic increase from the previous year. We grew by 15.67% against a global growth of 5%, which is dramatic. But look at the other countries. Spain gets 85 million tourists. Uh, France gets 75 million. US gets 75 million people. We have 100 times better monuments and more valuable monuments than any of these countries. This government is in a huge hurry. We want to produce results. We want employment to be created. We want the whole world to come and see India. That is how the economy will move. Well, staying with the Red Fort controversy, the chairman of the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Transport, Tourism and Culture, Derek O'Brien, has spoken exclusively to CNBC TV 18. He said that the Tourism Ministry presented the Adopt a Heritage Scheme and that the Standing Committee expressed serious reservations. He also added that the committee asked for a pilot scheme and that the Tourism Ministry never came back with a response. Well, let's move ahead now. After, after Red Fort, Hyderabad's Char Minar is the other heritage site that has generated buzz. Sources tell CNBC TV 18 that ITC has submitted an expression of interest for the monument under the government's Adopt a Heritage Scheme. Earlier in the day, Nitya Balakrishnan was at the site and filed this report. Hyderabad is home to the iconic Char Minar. Built 427 years ago, it marks the transfer of the capital of the Qutub Shahi dynasty from Golconda to Hyderabad. And importantly, what makes it so special is it's one of the 93 sites put up by the government of India for adoption. And sources in the tourism ministry tell CNBC TV 18 that FMCG major ITC has expressed an interest to adopt the Char Minar. What makes it so special is that it is located in the heart of Old City, draws tourists from the length and breadth of the country and across the globe. It is also home to the world-famous Batti Bazaar or Pearl Market, where pearl is exported to all parts of the globe, and also the Churi or Lard Bazaar, which is the bangle market that's tremendously popular here. Now, ITC has submitted a proposal that will indicate it will beautify upkeep, maintain and develop the area around the Charminar to ensure that it is one of the most popular tourist destinations in the country. ITC's long-standing relationship with Telangana, of course, needs no introduction. 8,000 crore rupees is the kind of investment in 2015 that ITC has pumped into the state. ITC Kohinoor and ITC Kakatiya, two landmark hotel properties, apart from which, of course, they're looking to expand their agro business here in the country as well as their paperboard business. So clearly, if Charminar adoption goes through. It will be a jewel in ITC's crown. Needless to say, it is a proposal that needs to be vetted by the state government as well. But it is a development that's got the entire city very abuzz with excitement. The Charminar, will ITC be lucky in adopting it? Remains to be seen. Nitya Balakrishnan, CNBC TV 18, Hyderabad. Right, Nita, thanks a lot for that report. Let's move ahead now, and we're slipping into a very short break. But on the other side, 
protest led by Raj Thakre begin in Maharashtra over land acquisition for the proposed bullet train project. Details when we return. Welcome back. Now, here's some tragic news. Over 80 people were reportedly killed after heavy rains and dust storms wrecked havoc in parts of Uttar Pradesh and the state of Rajasthan. Dust storms killed over 60 people in Uttar Pradesh, with Agra uh, witnessing the highest casualties. And over 30 people have died and over 100 were injured as strong dust storms hit Alwar, Bharatpur and Dholpur districts in Rajasthan. A banyan tree fell, uh, leading to chaos in the Alwar market. The Deputy Chief Minister of Uttar Pradesh, Keshav Prasad Maurya, announced that the state will compensate the affected citizens for their losses. पूरी संवेदना है पूरी सहानुभूति है और सरकार पूरी तरह से उन परिवारों के साथ खड़ी है जो लोगों की निजी क्षति हुई है संपत्तियों को नुकसान हुआ है उसका आकलन करके जितनी जल्दी हो सके उनके मुआवजे के वितरण का भी निर्देश दिया गया है well, the Narendra Modi government is facing some serious hurdles in getting its bullet train project to move forward. And these are not restricted to problems with just land acquisitions. CNBC TV 18's Ashpreet Sethi has the details. Ashpreet, what are the main grievances that farmers appear to have in this case? And the landowners, and what are the concerns uh, that they're putting across to the government here? Well, the Prime Minister's pet project seems to be in a fix for now with hurdles related to farmer protests, political opposition and even the fact that land acquisition has been one of the main concerns. The bullet train project has hit a roadblock with farmers beginning their protests in a district in Maharashtra which will be taken to other districts and even Gujarat. Now, why are farmers protesting? Their main demands are give us fair compensation for the land that you will be taking. Remember, over 200 villages will be affected in the two states. Now, the National Speed Rail Corporation has said that they will be setting aside 10,000 crore rupees as the acquisition cost for 1,400 hectares. Now, they've also raised objections to the short notice for stakeholders. Meetings and farmers have said that how states are not taking their consent before deciding the compensation amount. Now, sources tell us that the Prime Minister's office has asked the Project Monitoring Committee to oversee the whole process. In fact, the government will be holding chai, pichacha or tea sessions to allay whatever fears that the owners have, which will begin on May 5th. Right, Ashpreet, these concerns, as you said, uh, do happen to be concerns of the farmers and the landowners. But as you also said that these protests have also taken a political hue. Run us through some of the key objections that have been raised by the political stakeholders of the region. Well, absolutely, the issue has taken a political turn with the likes of MNS Congress leaders hitting out at the Prime Minister and his government. Now, let's go across to what the MNS Chief Raj Thakre has said. Do not sell your land for both Mumbai Ahmedabad Bullet Train and Mumbai Vadotra Expressway. Otherwise, they, uh, the government is trying to ensure that Marathi, Marathis from Mumbai are thrown out and Gujarat is brought closer to Maharashtra. That is what he said in his rally. Congress, Ahmed Patel has written to PM uh, saying that give fair compensation and do not bulldoze farmers' rights, otherwise it will lead to grave injustice. In fact, in an interview today to CNBC TV 18, Jairam Ravesh has made a similar statement asking for fair compensation. While the government is hopeful of resolving these concerns, it remains to be seen if the 2022 deadline remains feasible. Arashpi, thanks a lot for that. So some political concerns for this government. So one of the pet projects of this government. Uh, time now for a very short break. But on the other side, we will take you to Kerala, where the government is planning to double the number of international tourist arrivals over the next three years. On the other side. Well, Kerala's tourism industry is all set to hit top gear. That's because the state government has plans to double the number of international tourist arrivals and is targeting at least a 50% increase in domestic footfalls by the year 2021. CNBC TV 18's Jude Sarath reports on what the aggressive expansion blueprint contains. Kerala tourism has reported an 11% increase in footfalls with destinations like Kochi, Kovalam and the scenic Varkala beach where I'm at 
accounting for the highest number of overseas visitors. This, even as a hill town like Munar, has registered a whopping 34% increase in footfalls alone. But in three years, these sandy shores won't be the only stop on your Kerala travel itinerary, despite being a go-to destination. That's because with a target of 1.1 crore new visitors by 2021, the Kerala government wants to push North Kerala as an offbeat travel getaway. We want to increase the percentage of tourist arrivals, which is only 4.4% in North Kerala, mm -hmm. to at least 25% by 2021. This could draw an additional 25 lakh tourists to regions like Korikod, Vayanad and Kannur. Achieving this target will become easier once the Kannur International Airport, with its projected capacity of 8 million passengers per annum, becomes operational by September 2018. The Kerala government is also investing 325 crore rupees on a travel cruise experience along North Kerala's Malabar coast. It is also looking beyond its established tourism source markets in Western Europe and the Middle East to make up the numbers. And regions like Southeast Asia and China are on its radar. Footfalls from UAE, incidentally, have grown by 40% in the last five years and the state hopes this trend will continue in the coming years. All these efforts, the government says, should push tourism-driven revenues sharply higher from the current 33,000 crore rupees by the time 2021 rolls around. I'm not going so bullish on revenue generation because mm -hmm. uh, tourist travel doesn't automatically double up the mm -hmm. revenue. Mm -hmm. But then we are, we, are, we are very bullish about reaching 20%. But most importantly, Kerala Tourism claims these growth prospects could see an additional 4.5 lakh jobs being created by 2021 both in tourism and allied industries, starting with 1 lakh job opportunities opening up in just the next 12 months. In Thiruvanandapuram, Jude Sanit. Right, so Jude Sanit there reporting from God's own country. With that, it's a wrap on this edition of India Business R. Thank you so much for watching. Have a good night.